Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the webinar um, of Decarbonizing the Power Sector for Southeast Asia, hosted at the International Conference for Sustainable Development. Okay, thank you for enabling the chat. Um, we now have 50 people with us. Can you tell us through the chat where you, which countries you are from, please? Okay, whilst you are telling us where you are from, uh, we will proceed to introduce uh, the webinar. So this webinar is about Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia is important in the global climate change action for two reasons. Number one, it is one of the fastest growing regions in the world because of its population growth, economic development, and urbanization. Rapid growth of the electricity demand is driven by the growing ownership of household appliances and air conditioners, as well as increasing consumption of goods and services. Reason number two is that this is a region that is highly vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. The current power supply mix in Southeast Asia is dominated by fossil fuels, such as coal and oil. And these are major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions. Now to develop and reduce greenhouse gas emissions at the same time, Southeast Asia needs to increase its urgency and ambition in decarbonizing its power supply. So, investing in renewable energy, energy efficiency, grid infrastructure, interconnection, carbon capture and storage is the way forward. Southeast Asia needs to invest about 210 billion US dollars a year leading up to 2050 to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This investment is more than 2.5 times the amount that countries have currently planned to reach their goals. So the need for meaningful in planning and effective implementation is clear. And this is what the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network sets out to encourage and mobilize. For example, its ASEAN Green Future Project, which is a multi-year collaboration with Climate Works Center and researchers from leading universities and think tanks across Southeast Asia, builds an analytical foundation for inclusive regional power decarbonization. This project strengthens regional knowledge sharing and helps ASEAN member states to design and implement better green transformation of their economies. It also enables collective engagement with decision makers across Southeast Asia to translate evidence from analysis into targeted and measurable actions. Today, we are honored to have four ASEAN Green Future researchers here with us to share how their countries are decarbonizing the power sector. The power sector encompasses all activities related to the production, transmission, distribution, and consumption of electricity. They are Dr. San Vibo from the Royal University of Phnom Penh in Cambodia, Professor Alin Halimatu Sadia from the University of Indonesia in Indonesia, Professor Bandit Limechokchai from Thammasat University in Thailand, and Yang Berhormat Tuan Li Chienchung, Member of Parliament of Petaling Jaya in Malaysia. These four countries make up more than 80% of the electricity 
consumption in Southeast Asia. ASEAN Green Future Country teams received training from the Stockholm Environment Institute on the Low Emission Analysis Platform, LEAP, in March, April, and May this year. During a four-day workshop in Bangkok, country teams came together to collaboratively build a regional power sector model under the guidance of SEI. Post-workshop, the country teams continued to improve their country's power sector model and developed the existing policy and more ambitious policy scenarios, focusing on the demand and supply of electricity. Key learning points will be presented today. We will begin with um, Cambodia. Cambodia has been enjoying remarkable economic growth and development since the end of civil war and political instability in the late 1990s. Cambodia has been a fast mover in embracing the renewables. Last year, RE capacity share in Cambodia was 52%. Hydropower is the dominant contributor, followed by solar and bioenergy. The country has successfully used solar-based mini-grids to lift much of the rural population out of poverty and accelerate social economic progress. However, the dependency on hydropower makes the kingdom vulnerable to seasonal variations in water levels and climate change, as demonstrated by the daily power outages in many parts of Cambodia in 2019. To maintain its momentum as one of the fastest growing countries in Southeast Asia, Cambodia will be importing coal power from Laos to meet its electricity demand in 2030. Let us now hear from Dr. San Vibo from the Royal University of Phnom Penh on the opportunities and challenges for decarbonizing the power sector in Cambodia. The floor is yours, Dr. San Vibon. Good morning, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here to present about the uh, engagement in Chinese Cambodia. So let me start to share my screen. Vibon, your, your, your sound is breaking up. Uh, really? Yeah. Hello? Hello? You okay? Uh, we can hear you, but it's uh, it's not clear. How about Justin? Can you hear uh, Vibo clearly? It is so unclear for me. Uh, Vibo, if you have a an ear earphone with mic, I think that might be clearer. Okay, so I'm back to Hello. Yes. Is it okay? That, okay, that is that is great now. And Vibo, okay. you are, you, are, you you want to share your slides, right? Not the word document. Oh. Actually, I <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Is it okay? Yes. Okay. Sorry, it's a technical problem. <laughs> so, so again, good morning, everybody. So I'm happy to be here to present about the um energy transitions in Cambodia. I mean the current state of energies and policy. So as you already mentioned, uh, energies play an important role in economic development in every country and, and also energies uh, is one of the most uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions emitters in the world. And it's, it's quite, uh, I mean, the government have worked a lot to, uh, to ensure that uh, the uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, 
will be reduced from the energy sectors in the future. So um, this is the content of my presentation today. So I will start with introductions and then the energy profile of Cambodia. Uh, you have already uh, uh, summarized a little bit about that. So I will try to add something more and we go a little bit faster because of the time. So, and, and then I will uh, present a little bit about the greenhouse gas emission from energy sector in Cambodia. The first one is the current state of renewable energy in Cambodia and clean energy uh, potentials and opportunities. Government policy and initiative, and initiative. Uh, I just want to show uh, some uh, policy that the government have in, in order to promote the energy transition, especially renewable energy in Cambodia uh, to the use greenhouse gas emissions. And last but not least is uh, uh, energy challenges in Cambodia. Uh, because we have a lot of uh, uh, policy, but still we could not do whatever we uh, the, we want to do because there's a lot of uh, challenges that uh, we are facing and we need to deal with it. So uh, um, Cambodia economy experienced uh, rapid expansion from uh, 1999 to uh, 2018 ranking among the world fastest growing economies with an average annual growth rate of 8%. This, this growth was uh, primarily driven by sectors such as uh, government exports, agriculture, and tourism. The government has placed a strong emphasis on maintaining social stability and have set a global to trend the goal, a goal to transform Cambodia into a uh, technology driven upper middle income country by uh, uh, 2030. However, the outbreaks of the COVID-19 pandemic have a significant impact on the country's economic pro progress. In 2020, Cambodian uh, GDP is contracted by 3.1%, reflecting the economic downtown cost uh, downturn caused by the pandemic. Nevertheless, the country demonstrated resilience and rebounded with a growth rate of 3.1% in 2021. To support economic development, construction and real estate sectors have played a crucial role in boosting of foundational growth industry. Looking ahead, Asian Development Bank, ADB, focused a positive trajectories for Cambodian economies, uh, projecting a growth rate of 5.3% of, of in 2022 and 6.2% in uh, 2023. So, uh, Sustained economic growth in Cambodia have resulted in a significant rise in energy demand. Over the period from 2010 to 2019, the total primary energy supplies experienced a substantial increase of 64%, going from uh, more than uh, 100, 190 uh, terazul to more than 300 uh, terazul. Cambodian, uh, Cambodia economy supply rely heavily on biomass, accounting for 45% of the total primary energy supply in 2019. Within the biomass sector, more than 40% was utilized for residents of cooking and heating purposes, while another 40% was used in the production of charcoal primary consumed by household. Approximately 50% of biomass was utilized in industrial applications. The demand 55% of the total primary energy supply is composed of imported oil and coal. Notably, around 87% of petroleum is consumed in the transportation sector. Transport sector while coal accounting for a rapidly increased 40% of uh, Total, total primary uh, energy supply is primarily used for uh, power generation, with 3% being used in industry. This is 
This, this surge in coal usage can be attributed to the implementation of two coal fi uh, fire power plants in uh, Brazil and uh, province between 2014 to, and 2017, which aim to reuse the relies on the um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, so yeah, something wrong. I mean, uh, primary uh, use for the generating with uh, 3% being used in industrial research is coal usage can be attributed to the implementation of two coal fire power plant in uh, Pesinovil province between uh, 19 to uh, 2017, which aim to reuse a rely on oil based uh, power generation accounting to the government plan. So that's, that is the reason why the coal power plant was uh, were introduced in, in Cambodia because the government had planned to to reduce the dependencies on the uh, the uh, oil. So let me start with the uh, uh, energy uh, profile in Cambodia. So I, I would like to draw you uh, your attention to the uh, the graphs which uh, showcase a remarkable trends in the capacities of power sources in Cambodia over the past 15 years. In 2008, the capacity stood at uh, 490 megawatts. And um, Cambodia have um, seen a tremendous increase to uh, an, an impressive more than 4,000 uh, 400 megawatt in 2022. In 2022, this substantial growth signifies a remarkable progress made in expand, expanding the Cambodian power infrastructures. So allow me to present you in the the information from the table which provide insightful data on power sources in Cambodia. For, for the year 2021, 2022, and the plan big year for uh, 2030, uh, 23. The power generation is divided into uh, two categories, domestic generation, as you can see is the import power sources. Let's start with the domestic generation. In 2021, non-renewable energies uh, accounted for 41% more than for approximately 41% of the total power generated, which uh, slightly decreased to uh, uh, 38, a uh, little bit more than 38% in 2022. But this projected to increase significantly to more almost 60% uh, in 2023. Within the non-renewable uh, uh, energies, coal contributed to uh, the majorities making up uh, more than 35% in 2021. And um, also the same, uh, the percentage is, is almost the same in 2022. And it's expected to con contribute uh, uh, 54, more than 54% in 2023. Fuel and oil play a small role in between the non renewable energy mix. On the other hand, renewable energy sources contributed for um, more than 58% of the total domestic generations in 2021. It increased to a uh, little bit more than 61% in 2022, but is anticipated to increase to uh, for more than 40% in 2023. The primary source for the renewable energy were hydropower, as uh, you have already mentioned. Saying. However, solar power and biomass also uh, play an important role in the uh, renewable energy shares. Hydropower have the largest shares, followed by, yeah, because uh, we have uh, more than 50% uh, uh, 50 of the hydropower. So it, it's a huge share compared to the solar power and biomass. Uh, biomass uh, power. In terms of the total domestic generation, we witnessed an increase from uh, more than uh, 9,000 uh, 
uh, kilowatt hour in 2021 to more than 10,000 kilowatt hour in 2022. And we expect to further grow to more than 12,000 uh, gigawatt hour in 2023. So um, yeah, let me uh, tell you a little bit more about the uh, current status of renewable energy in, in Cambodia. In a remarkable achievement, as of uh, 2022, over 55% of the country's domestic uh, energy product is derived from the new more renewable energy. This milestone reflects Cambodian steadfast uh, commitment to sustainable and environmentally uh, friendly uh, energy generation. The backbone of this, um, as you can see, is on the graph. <clears throat> of this renewable energy uh, success story is uh, hydropower, which contributes an uh, impressive more than 50% to the overall energy mix. While the hydropower is re uh, renewable, it does remain slightly controversial due to its environmental impacts with issues such as the flooding of large areas and the, back, uh, the blockings of fish migrations, as well as forced uh, evictions. These concerns were undoubtedly a factor in the Ministry of Mine and Energy halting all hydropower on the main uh, Mekong rivers uh, until uh, 2030, which have stalled the growth of uh, hydropower to a degree. Other concerns with the hydropower include the lack of water during the dry season. The reason record low water levels in general. The impact other hydropower dam for the up rivers could have, notably the potential dam in uh, Luang Prabang's Lao. Uh, regardless, of the controversial controversies, it will continue to increase as shares of power generation in Cambodia and development on the other uh, tributaries continues. In addition to hydropower, solar and biomass have also made significant contribution to Cambodia renewable energy portfolio. Solar account for approximately 7% of the country domestic uh, products, energy products. Cambodian uh, favorable climates and ample sunshine make it an ideal environment for ham uh, harnessing solar energy. So this is the, 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 the map of uh, hydropower in Cambodia. I mean, in 2006, Cambodia identified 60 potential hydropower sites capable of generating around more than around uh, 7,000 kilowatt power, or about a uh, megawatt of power. Half of this size were on the Mekong River, so 40% on the Butteries and 10% in the Southwest. So you can see here now the, uh, the Ministry of Mine Energy stopped uh, approving approving more uh, hydropower dams on the uh, uh, Mekong River. So at least we still have uh, like a 40% uh, from on the tributaries and 10% in the south. So we have a uh, 50% for the um, uh, hydropower development in the future. So a company have set ambitious goal to further expand its uh, renewable energy capacity by 2023, the, uh, the, the country had planned to add more than uh, 495 megawatt, uh, me, uh, megawatt of electricity generation from uh, seven new solar power plants, increasing solar power shares to 20% of install capacity. Looking ahead to 2030s, Cambodia aim to have more, uh, one, uh, more than 1,000, more than 1,800 megawatt of solar energy integrated into its uh, national grid. This target demonstrates Cambodia's commitment to sustainable power generation and its uh, determination to harness the uh, full potential uh, of solar energy resources. 
So this is the biomass, as I already mentioned uh, in the introduction, biomass uh, is uh, abundant resources in Cambodia. And uh, the, I mean, especially for the rural people, they, they use uh, the biomass for cooking, boiling water, or sometimes they use it for, uh, I mean, protects animal from insect as well. And uh, biomass is the main source for producing such charcoal as well. However, it's important it have a huge impact on the deforest, deforest area because uh, the people cut down the tree to, to fit into the kins. And we, we consume a lot of uh, charcoal, especially the people in the uh, urban area. So let me uh, try to uh, tell you a little bit more about the, uh, I mean, the GHG emissions. Uh, from the energy sector, so because of the run out of time, so I just will I will go with go quickly. So as you can see, the in, uh here is the, the graph. So the uh, I mean the CO two emission from the energy sector in Cambodia from uh, nineteen ninety five to two thousand eighteen. As you can see, the resident solar sector is uh, have the second highest. Uh, emission among all sector and the um, transportation uh, sector have the highest emission overalls recording more than 6,000 uh, in two, um, uh, uh, 2018. In 2018. So here is the historical emission from the DC generation. The primary sources of direct uh, greenhouse gas emission from the uh, electricity generation in Cambodia were fuel oils. Even it, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's just a uh, small shares of the total electricity uh, generation, but it emit a lot of uh, uh, gas emission, fuel oils and coal uh, bituminous. Uh, fuel oil uh, emission show an increase from uh, uh, more than 120 kiloton of oil equivalent in 2019 to uh, more than 250 to kiloton of oil equivalent in 2018. And coal from more than 3,000 in 2017 into the, uh, uh, it's decreased a little bit uh, in 2018, but still a lot compared to the other sectors. So, um, so I, Actually, I want to tell you a little bit about the clean energy potential opportunity in Cambodia, but because of time, so I will just go uh, a little bit faster. But solar energy, is, I mean, clean energy is, uh, is important and it have uh, uh, numerous opportunities in the uh, realm of the uh, clean energies in Cambodia. And solar energy contributes a little bit to the total electricity generation but it have a huge impact. For example, like uh, um, it was estimated at the uh, 60 gigawatt hours annually. So um, this means that the country uh, possesses abundant solar resource with up to eight hours of sunlight per day. So um, in addition to the uh, solar uh, powers, hydropower is another, Tips and high uh, promising renewable energy sources in Cambodia, especially uh, in the coastal uh, area. The biomass uh, uh, energy also have a huge potential in Cambodia because we have a lot of uh, forest areas and we have a, a huge uh, uh, agricultural residue like rajas, cassava, coconuts, and animal waste. So um, over uh, uh, 25,000 bio biogas digester has been uh, constructed in the rural area in 2016. So biogas digester is also most, uh, is the most important also for, especially for the rural area. And it can help to reuse the uh, biomass, the traditional biomass consumption in the, in the rural area. So, um, let me try to um, tell you a little bit about the government policies and initiatives in energy sectors in Cambodia. So uh, the government uh, social economic uh, policy agenda for uh, 2018 to 2023 is unpin the provisions of 
adequate affordable and reliable electricity. And recently, the 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 government also have the um, we call like a pentagonal uh, strategic phase one, which just a uh, relief and uh, by the uh, the new government. So it will start uh, implementations from this year. So we also have the electricity law uh, into uh, in two thousand one. So. The law covers generation, transmission, distribution, and utilization of electricity energy, aiming to meet Cambodian growing energy demand effectively, efficiently, and reliably. Reliable, uh, reliably. It emphasizes energy efficiencies and conservation measures, promoting adapting energy uh, of efficient technologies and practice. This law introduced key component that govern the operation of a uh, uh, power sector. It established principle for power industry operation, include the condition for uh, competitions, private investment, private ownerships, and commercial uh, operations. In addition, the electric, uh, electricity law defined the role and function of two key entities. Uh, Electricity authorities of Cambodia and Ministry of Mine and Energy. I mean, EAC is responsible for regulating and overseeing the power sectors, uh, ensuring the compliance with the laws and promoting fair competition. While the um, Ministry of Mine and Energy play a crucial role in form formulating policy, setting uh, strategic uh, directions, and uh, providing overall guidance for uh, energy sector in Cambodia. So um, in 2009, the Ministry of Mine Energies of Cambodia took a significant step forward ensuring the reliable energy supply by producing the Cambodian Basics Energy Plan. This plan was developed with the key principle in mind, including affordability, accessibility, security, safety, and transparency. So uh, in March 2018, a national energy efficiency policy was officially launched, uh, which focuses on adapting energy efficiency to drive a strong, reprints and competitive economy while promoting sustainable development. At the same time, uh, power development master plan was also released. So the, 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 the PDP 2020-2024, uh, which outlined the long-term vision of Cambodian power sector development. The PDD, uh, PDP set forth uh, several key objectives, including meeting future power demand, enhancing energy security, and increasing the shares of clean energy sources. So this is uh, the, the, the newest uh, uh, master plan. And it's it, I mean, it, it uh, show the ambitions of the government. It, to, to promote the clean energy to reuse a greenhouse gas emission in Cambodia. So we also have the National Cooling Action Plan. which is a, a strategic roadmap designed to address the environmental and social impacts of the increasing cooling demand driven by economy, economic growth, urbanization, and climate change. I mean, the, uh, we also adapt the uh, resource uh, uh, efficiencies and cleaner production in Cambodia also. I mean, the implementation of uh, WIC has been impressed across various sectors. For example, in the rye milling industrial, RECS uh, strategy have been applied to address the issues of waste uh, rye has. And also uh, this applies to the, um, uh, the, the paddy millings as well implemented by the uh, UNIDO. We also have the long-term uh, strategy for carbon neutrality, which is a roadmap designed to guide Cambodia towards ach achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. This comprehensive strategy outlines specific action to reduce the uh, CO2 emissions across various sectors 
to mitigate the impact of climate change. We also have the new law investment uh, promulgated in October 2021, provide additional tax incentive to incentives to uh, green energy producers. The green energy producer are able to register as a qualified investment project and are one of the uh, sector to be in, uh, incentivized. The law offer different options for of uh, basic incentives, but the likely the most common use include the income tax exemption. So if, even though we have a lot of policies and the government puts a lot of commitment into the uh, uh, promoting renewable energy and clean energy in Cambodia, but still we face, we face a lot of uh, 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 challenges. For example, one of the, the, the main challenges is uh, Cambodia electricity demand and fossil fuel. I mean, Cambodia have in, uh, indeed undergone significant population and economic growth in the recent years, leading to a substantial increase in electricity demand. These growth have put the pressures on the country energy sectors to meet the rise need of the uh, industrial business and household. So um, electricity supplies and power system is also one of the main uh, uh, challenges. I mean, Cambodia electricity network face, faces uh, stability issues leading to frequently power cut. However, the necess necessaries investment to prevent this power cut have not been met. The state-owned run utilities, electricity is Cambodge, or they say, was uh, supposed to invest uh, 600 million in infrastructure upgrade over the past five years, but have failed to meet this uh, target. Inefficient investment have uh, contributed to ongoing problem with electricity uh, network. To address this issue, Cambodia need to prioritize and accelerate investment in its uh, power systems. Electricity price is also uh, challenges. Because uh, Cambodia, I mean, face uh, challenges with high and uh, volatile power costs, impacting both households and businesses. In 2020, the electricity price in the country reached both their low and uh, highest levels in the past uh, 15 years, uh, indicating the significant in inflation in price. Comparing to it, Southeast Asian neighbors, Cambodia electricity tariffs are gener generally higher. These disparities uh, can be uh, attributed to the various factors, including the country relatively small scale power generation and transmission infrastructures, higher production costs, and uh, limited uh, energy uh, di diversification. Climate uh, challenge, please, also is one of the, the main um, challenges in Cambodia as well. So we have the other challenges as well, in, including the uh, inefficient uh, funding, skill level shortage, and uh, policy framework inadequacies. Even though we have a lot of uh, policy, but still the implementations, the clear um, I mean, a comprehensive uh, policy framework is still the question. And also uh, another thing is that the, 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 the coordination between the inline ministry is still a big problem. Sometimes they don't really want to work together in order to solve the same problem. They just maybe uh, sometimes they have a con uh, the interest uh, of, uh, I mean, the conflict between the, uh, the, among the uh, ministry. So um, that's all for my presentation today. So I'm sorry about because I prepared a lot of slides and <laughs> I just realized this morning that I have only 16 uh, minutes, but now it's already 13 minutes. So you thank have you very much, uh, Dr. Vibo, for your very comprehensive assessment of the power sector decarbonization in Cambodia. What you have shared is inspiring 
And you can see in the uh, Q&A box, one of our audience has asked, how might, might, might Cambodia have any other have advice uh, for her country, which is Indonesia? All right, we'll now move on to Indonesia. Indonesia has 26% of the electricity consumption in Southeast Asia, and they are the largest consumer of electricity in the region. Its energy transition is essential to achieving the region's climate goals. The country has made significant progress in developing renewable energy in recent years, and the government is committed to improve energy efficiency. The Just Energy Transition Partnership that Indonesia entered into last year will provide significant financial and technical support to Indonesia's energy transition. Let us now hear from Professor Alin Halimatu Sadia from the University of Indonesia. Alin, the floor is yours. Thank you, Professor Yuen uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, let me uh, share my screen. Okay. Sorry, it took a while. <laughs> okay, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, in, in the full uh screen, yeah. Um, it's currently in, no. uh, it's not very okay, full. I will try again. <laughs> I will try again. Uh, sorry. Okay, there is a suggestion from Mustafa, say clip swap display. Uh, I don't know how. It used to work. Okay. Uh... Yes. Okay. Thank you. Now it works. Great. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so I will uh, present uh, our uh, work uh, on how to decarbonize Indonesia power sector. Uh, so uh, we are very thankful to uh, USDSN uh, to provide us uh, capacity building and also uh, the uh, assist us in the analysis of, of this uh work so first uh, i would like to uh, present the current state of indonesia's power sector where uh energy sector contribute uh as the largest uh ghg emission uh, about almost 35 percent uh, in 2019 and within the energy sector uh, the electricity generation contributes uh, more than 30 percent to the emission and it becomes the biggest emission contributor within the energy sector. Uh, and if we look at the demand side, uh, most of the electricity uh, demand uh, come from residential uh, and after that uh, industry. Uh, and for the last two decades, it's uh, almost like triple, more than uh, triple there. Yeah. Uh, and if we look at the supply side, uh, where the electricity demands are uh, covered from, so if we look at the supply side, most of the electricity uh, comes from the coal uh, fired power plant. So we see the uh, the sharp increase in the, the coal fired power plants from only thirty six percent in two thousand two. Uh, almost 60 percent 
yeah, uh, in 2019. So it become our homework uh, in decarbonizing the power sector. And uh, we currently we have several uh, decarbonization scenario. Uh, some of the uh, decarbonization scenario embedded in uh, more broader uh, plan like uh, net zero emission for all sectors. So uh, what we uh, shown here is only for electricity. So we have, for example, like LTS LCCR in 2021, uh, we uh, issued uh, long-term strategies for low carbon uh, development in Indonesia. Uh, and uh, this document is already uh, already submitted uh, to the UNFCCC uh, and it become our commitment to decarbonize the economy as a whole. And uh, in this document, uh, we uh, just look at the electricity uh, sector and we compare it with uh, other document because uh, uh, aside from LTS LCCR, we also have uh, EAA who also uh, produce a document uh, to decarbonize energy sector. And the next one, LCDI Indonesia, uh, issued by uh, BAPNAS, the National uh, Development Planning Agency. And we have ROKN. ROKN here is the national electricity planning uh, and some of the non-government institution also produce uh, the a model uh, showing the trajectory of decarbonization such as uh, ISR uh, and also uh, the Asia Society Policy Institute uh, and IRENA also uh, make some models uh, to show the potential decarbonization. So uh, we some kind of mapping from these uh, seven documents uh, in the electricity sector, what the strategy we should have, and then uh, the target. And uh, we see from uh, these two, uh, from the seven documents, uh, they have maybe slightly different strategies and also assumption. Uh, like for example, in LTS LCCR, the electricity demand growth 5.5% uh, per year, uh, while in EAA uh, model, uh, they uh, assume uh, the demand increase by seven percent. Yeah. So uh, and also in uh, specific strategy, for example, for uh, transport uh, in LTS LCCR, uh, we assume the share of electric uh, transport uh, will be thirty percent by two thousand and fifty. Uh, while in other uh, uh, scenario, yeah, it can be forty five percent here. 45%, uh, even in its LCDI, uh, they assume 100% uh, EV adoption by 2050. Uh, and yeah, so we can see the difference uh, of the strategy uh, achieving net zero emission. And if we look at the uh, share of renewables in uh, these two document, uh, these seven documents, uh, we will see also a uh, difference where, for example, ISR assumed that in 2050, the electricity uh, will come from renewables, all the electricity will come from renewables, uh, and from uh, the document of LCDI, uh, 80 of 5%, uh, and then ASPI uh, almost 198%. Uh, yeah, eighty three uh, percent, and we see, for example, from the document LTS LCCR, we also we only uh, have uh, forty uh, three point five percent of renewables, uh, and uh, we still have uh, coal and gas here because uh, in in the document. Uh, the net zero emission is for all sectors. So we depend on other sectors to uh, reduce or absorb the emission. So we uh, optimize the uh, the uh, absorption of em emission from uh, the polu sector. That's why in LTS LCCR, we have quite high uh, fossil fuels in 2050. Uh, and then uh, we make uh, 
scenario building for this study, uh, we make two scenarios, existing policy scenarios and high ambition uh, scenario. Uh, for macroeconomic assumption, we follow uh, shared socioeconomic pathways or SSP2 uh, for middle uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, for middle uh, of the road, so we put like some kind of moderate uh, assumption for this macroeconomic uh, indicators, population, GDP growth, yeah. Uh, and then for demand sector, for residential, uh, for lighting, uh, we make the same scenario for existing and high ambition scenarios. Uh, but for cooking, uh, we have uh, quite different scenario where, for example, uh, in urban household, uh, we expect uh, the electricity uh, from cooking uh, rose by 25% in 2050 for uh, existing policy, while in the high ambition policy, uh, we assume 75%. Yeah? Uh, and then for uh, rural household, uh, only 10% in existing policy, while in the high ambition policy for rural, uh, we assume 60%, and for the overall share of electric cooking, uh, for ur urban also uh, reach uh, 90%. For refrigeration, uh, air conditioning, and cooling, uh, we use uh, the same scenario for existing and high emission policy. And then for uh, transport, uh, we uh, put different uh, scenario. Uh, for example, in 2050, uh, the existing policy scenario uh, only aims for uh, 50% by 2050, uh, but in high ambition policy, uh, we uh, hope we can reach uh, 100%. Uh, for the industry, for the existing policy scenario, uh, we use historical trends, uh, but for high ambition policy, uh, we expect to have 55% uh, industry sector electrified by 2060. Uh, and then for service, we use the same, uh, the same scenario. Uh, and for agriculture, we uh, use historical trend for existing policy scenario. But for high ambition policy, we uh, aims for almost thirty percent. Yeah, the share of electricity from this sector. And then for uh, the supply sector, uh, in power generation, we follow. Uh, the business use, uh, as usual scenario in the ROKN or National General uh, Electricity Plan. Uh, this is the uh, document uh, published by the government uh, that uh, show the trajectory uh, of uh, power generation from 2023 until 2060. Uh, but in existing policy scenario, we take it from, from this but from business as usual scenario. So uh, early retirement of coal fire power plant is not implemented. But for um, high ambition scenario, uh, we follow the net zero emission uh, using the same uh, document with 100 uh, renewable energy share by 2060. So this is the result. Uh, so first, uh, I would like to discuss the electricity demand by sector, residential, agriculture, and fishing, service, industry, and transport. And we uh, see uh, quite different uh, demand. Yeah, uh, The amb high ambition pathway uh, demand uh, is more than double. Yeah, More than double than existing policy pathway because of uh, electricity uh, in uh, increasing uh, electricity demand from the industry sector as well as the uh, transportation sector. And then uh, from the uh, direct emission, yeah, this is the previous one is for the demand for electricity. Uh, and then this is for uh, the emission, uh, we see uh, different uh, trajectory also and different level uh, of emission over time uh, where we expect uh, to reduce lower 
uh, emission for the high emission uh, pathway uh, and the reduction is mostly come from the transport and also the industry. And then for power uh, generation mix, uh, because of uh, the demand for electricity more than double, so we expect to have uh, electricity generation uh, production or capacity also uh, much higher uh, for high, amb high ambition pathway than uh, existing policies pathway. And uh, it will come from uh, mostly from the uh, solar, PV, uh, hydro, and also we assume we use nuclear here uh, to serve uh, the demand. Yeah. While in the existing policy, uh, we also use uh, solar, but not as much as high ambition uh, pathway and uh, much less hydro uh, and no nuclear uh, power plant. And for the emission, uh, from the power sector, because we assume that uh, renewables uh, don't emit any emission, uh, which is it becomes also our limitation. So we assume that the emission only uh, in the power sector only comes from the uh, coal, gas, and diesel. Uh, so this is the uh, pathway uh, for uh, the emission in the power sector for existing policies compared to high, high emission pathways. Uh, we expect no emissions comes from fossil fuels in 2060 because we assume 100% uh, of renewables uh, in that time. And then uh, the emission results from demand and supply. Uh, we assume no emission uh, from the supply side in the 2060. Yeah. Uh, but in the for high ambition pathway, but for existing policies pathway, we still uh, produce uh, emission from the supply side. But from the demand side, because uh, not all sectors use the power sector, because uh, our model is only limited to the power sector. So we still have, for example, transport that use fossil fuels, and then industry still use coal. Uh, so we still have uh, or we still uh, generate emission from uh, the uh, demand side that still use uh, uh, coal, gas, and diesel for their fuels. So uh, we we made this reflection uh, for our exercise using the LEAP model. First is the model has uh, not include a resource constraint. Uh, maybe that's why uh, for example, for hydro, uh, we produce like uh, quite large share for hydro, while maybe in other models, uh, is the portion of hydro is less uh, and the portion of uh, solar PV is uh, much more. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the next one is no direct emission for renewable uh, power plant. Uh, and also, uh, we assume energy efficiency potential for cooling and refrigeration uh, is omitted, uh, while it can be uh, quite significant, maybe. Uh, and then the next one is power mix target under existing policy uh, in, is unchievable. And for potential model improvement, uh, we suggest that we need to have more exercise on sub-national modeling. Yeah. Uh, and how uh, it will be aligned with the national model. Uh, because in Indonesia, uh, we uh, have this regulation uh, to the province level. Uh, they should make a RUET, yeah, uh, look uh, the, the energy planning of at the local level, at the sub-national uh, sub level, and not all uh, local government uh, provide this uh, planning yeah, document. So I think uh, we need to also increase our capacity at the local level uh, to be able for them to uh, make some kind of modeling and then uh, produce uh, this energy planning uh, document. And uh, we need also uh, for potential model improvement, we need to improve granularity 
uh, by more disaggregation uh, and then also employing optimization method uh, with this resource con uh, resource constraint. And regarding the uh, increasing our national capacity in energy transition modeling, uh, we only have uh, about half of subnational RA targets in RUET uh, that are lower than national targets. So we have to push actually uh, the uh, the local government to make more ambitious uh, target, yeah, uh, of renewables, yeah. Uh, because the alignment of national and subnational is very important, and uh, we also have to make the modeling process is more uh, participative. Uh, so we have to encourage participatory part participatory approach in developing the scenario. Uh, what kind of policy it is actually feasible, uh, economically and politically. Yeah, uh, and then also we have to. I think we should we should. Uh, promote uh, open model and open open data to make the model more credible and also uh, make uh, other stakeholders participate in in developing the model. And then uh, I think we need also regional cooperation in developing regional model. Uh, so uh, high participation and new opportunity to reduce uh, GHG emission uh, uh, will come from this. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Alin, um, for a very clear articulation of what you all have done in phase 2.1 and for listing out the limitations of the model and how uh, you all plan to improve it uh, moving forward. And uh, it, is, um, it is good to hear you highlighting the importance of subnational modeling and alignment with national model and the importance of co-developing scenarios and models uh, with the stakeholders. Thank you very much. All right, moving on, we will now come to Thailand. Thailand has 19% of the electricity consumption in Southeast Asia, and they are the third largest electricity consumer in the region after Vietnam. Now, during COP26 in 2021, Thailand committed to reach carbon neutrality by 2050 and net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2065. Two years ago, 66% of Thailand's power generation mix was covered by natural gas and 17% by coal, while low carbon sources provided only 12%. Electricity accounts for 35% of the energy sector's carbon emissions. Thailand has also implemented energy efficiency programs for buildings and industry. However, the country also plans to build four new coal-fired power generators by 2034. Hence, a rapid scale-up of clean generation will be needed to align Thailand's power sector development with the country's climate commitments. Let us now hear from Professor Bandit Limechokchai from Thammasat University in Thailand. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you, yeah. Thank you Professor Jianzhong. Uh... For Thailand, we have uh, two research institutes like working on uh, ASEAN Green Future here. Today, I would like to uh, present uh, the task to Taiwan for high ambition. Let's see situation of Thailand. For demographic and macroeconomic information, population of Thailand now is about uh, 17 million, with average annual growth rate very low, 0.8%. Uh, we are now uh, facing the problem of aging society uh, from uh, the current year to the near and long term future. For domestic production, 
last domestic production, uh, the total uh, GDP in the year 2018 is around 1,172 billion US dollar PPP with average uh, code of GDP from the year 1995 around 3%. Yeah, this is not so bad. Uh, however, compared to uh, greenhouse gas emission in uh, national greenhouse gas inventory, uh, the greenhouse gas increasing only uh, 1.9 percent. Uh, uh, this information information show that Thailand is one of uh, some country in ASEAN that can decouple economic growth from using fossil fuel. Even we still have a lot of uh, infrastructure using uh, fossil fuel, like Professor Jun Jung mentioned. For any consumption, you can see that uh, the, the, the middle column show you that uh, industry and transport are the majority. Uh, majority. Uh, approximately around 39-37 percent, it depending on some year. Total final year consumption by sector, uh, the middle column, the bottom uh, graph show you that uh, natural gas, yeah, almost half the uh, all of the fuel used in Thailand. For the right column, show you electricity generation in uh, 2018. You can see that uh, natural gas used for electricity generation very high, 57. Like this is lower than in the past. In the past 10 years, uh, share of natural gas was almost 80%, which is very vulnerable like because uh, half of natural gas we uh, have to import, not uh, domestic resource. In terms of greenhouse gas emission, the right column at the bottom, you can see that uh, industry and transport share almost equally about 36 37 percent, depending on some year. Yeah, for the key uh, driver for engine demand, the GDP projection for Thailand, we uh, follow. Uh, SP2, uh, SP2, and for population projection also, we use the medium scenario. You can see that uh, population from uh, now decreasing, yeah, decreasing until the year 2050 and 2080. For the current existing policy, the existing policy uh, here, uh, we have uh, out of the TV development plan or AEDP. Uh, updated version still under consideration of the new government because just we just have the new government this month. We use any FGC plan EEP, the version is 2018, because updated version still under consideration of the, uh, the cabinet. And power development plan PDP 2018. The sector, you can see that uh, the sector we have residential, commercial, industry, transport, and power. Okay. Existing policy for our e plan 2018, we try to utilize world energy up to 30% by the target year of the plan, that is 2037. Uh, 2000, that is the, the target year of the plan. And also, we try to improve energy efficiency about uh, 30% that uh, the energy intensity uh, compared to uh, the base year. For high ambition policy, high ambition policy uh, we obtained from uh, government uh, target year that is 2037 to 2060. Uh, of existing policy by increasing uh, the chair of remote energy and increasing EG efficiency. Of course, uh, we realize that even high ambition policy, we could not utilize remote energy such as remote XD up to 100% due to limitation. Here yeah, are the result. You can see total final energy uh, demand by sector 
you can see that the base year 2018, uh, the target year 2060, you can see that uh, final yield demand increased about 2.2 times. Uh, for high emission policy, we can reduce uh, yield demand by 27%. If you look at uh, the figure in the right uh, column, you can see that uh, the target year for high emission policy industry, including uh, power generation, uh, have to increase and uh, transport sector. At this moment, uh, you can see existing policy show you uh, very high uh, energy demand. Uh, and in uh, high emission, uh, the transport sector also have to reduce. In terms of final yield demand by fuel tie, you can see the left, uh, the graph that uh, show you that uh, in, in the existing policy, in existing policy, oil consumption uh, increased a lot, uh, and uh, followed by electricity, power sector. But in a high emission uh, scenario, we have to reduce oil consumption. Electricity generation, of course, we need to uh, uh, chip to you uh, green electricity, such as solar and biomass and uh, wind. However, we have limitation of uh, using uh, biomass. According to the study of Ministry of New Thailand, and also uh, hydro, but increasing hydro power import from uh, Rao, for example, generation me. You can see that uh, existing policy that existing generation uh, have to increase around 2.5 times compared to uh, the base year. Many hydro power that uh, in existing policy and natural gas. Uh, in a high emission policy, uh, power generation a little bit increase. Uh, this is the chair of electricity generation by fuel. You can see that uh, in the base year, natural gas chair about 57%. Uh, and in existing uh, policy by the year 2060, the chair of natural gas uh, a little bit decreasing. Why share of hydro power, mainly import uh, hydro power from Lao, uh, increasing. For high emission fossil power, power generation, that means share of uh, natural gas uh, reduced from 48 to 39. And also we need to uh, increase share of biomass power generation, share of solar and wind electricity generation. In terms of greenhouse gas emission in energy sector, you can see that uh, the base year emission in uh, energy sector is around uh, 257 million ton CO2 60, emission uh, increased around 2.1 times. Uh, in high emission uh, policy, you can see that uh, we can reduce. Uh, it uh, up to 42%, uh, up to 42%. Uh, it is not net zero emission, not net zero emission. Chair of electricity, uh, sorry, sorry, chair of uh, GitHub gas emission by sector, you can see that uh, in the base year, uh, power sector, transport sector are uh, majority, chair almost equally in the base year. Uh, in the target year 2060, existing policy show you that transport sector uh, still uh, very high chair. Why uh, power sector almost be the same? Uh, in uh, high emission policy, we need to uh, electrify, electrify transport sector, such as uh, shifting uh, from internal combustion engine to electric vehicle. Of course, uh, power generation in uh, power sector uh, have uh, to be increased. Now, come to the net zero scenario for the TAC 2.2. For net zero sector, we need to increase the chair uh, and chair of uh, efficiency improvement, especially for lighting, uh, use more LED, and also uh, we need to 
improve its efficiency in the air conditioning. Of course, at this moment, uh, the Thai government already have building the code. Uh, in fact, we have this building the code for long term, uh, almost 30 years. But, but uh, it was uh, voluntary. At this moment, building the code now become uh, compulsory. So that means uh, building construction uh, have to follow building the code. Commercial sector, the same as lesser sector, we need to follow uh, building in the code. Industrial sector, uh, of course, we have to increase the uh, utilization of renewable energy. And of course, we have to fade out what Professor Jun Yong mentioned, uh, coal fire power plant. At this moment, this year, 2023, uh, several coal fire power plant in Thailand now, uh, they are coal firing using ammonia. Of course, what they want from ammonia, that is uh, hydrogen. Right. So they try to reduce emission for uh, uh, coal fire power plant according to NDC of Thailand. NDC of Thailand uh, by CO2 deduction, we promise to reduce uh, CO2 by 30%. So now they are co-filing uh, uh, with hydrogen from uh, ammonia. However, gases uh, for, for burning uh, ammonia misgated. Uh, one issue that uh, mentioned in uh, Long Term City of Thailand that submit to GNFC is CCU, CCS carbon capture, utilization, and carbon capture and storage. Uh, we say that uh, official document of uh, long-term state to do it mentioned that we tie to July uh, by the year 2040. However, uh, if Thailand can explore uh, technical facility and economic facility, we will utilize CCU, CCS early uh, in our net zero we try to uh, propose the year we uh, need to increase CCS in uh, industry. For the of sector, we already have the plan. The plan of new vehicle must be uh, thirty percent at least by the year twenty thirty. We have to follow that plan. This is the a very good scenario because if uh, the next zero scenario we follow a uh, government policy, uh, of course, our result uh, when we present to the public, to the country, the minister, uh, minister or uh, prime minister of the country uh, uh, can accept that study. But uh, this is the the biggest problem. Of Professor Bandit. Okay. But uh, at this moment, we try to make it early to uh, 2035. Yeah, some interruption. Yeah, for power uh, sector, this is uh, the main sector that we need to be decarbonized before other sector because transport sector uh, uh, now is uh, going to be electrified using uh, the train system and electric vehicle. Uh, building residential also uh, improve efficiency mainly uh, electric device. In the uh, industry, uh, we uh, introduce our energy and also uh, electrify uh, uh, the device in uh, industry. So
So the power sector will pay very important role. We expect that we can start uh, using CCS by the year 2035 and also bio energy with CCS or BECS uh, after uh, CCS by the year 2040 to 2060. This is uh, some different document that we use in uh, analysis of uh, the TAC 2.1. Uh, I hope that Thailand can present uh, the TAC 2.2 uh, as mentioned within uh, the TAP frame. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Bandit. Uh, I'm glad you touched on uh, carbon capture, storage, and utilization. Uh, there is a question in the Q&A uh, uh, precisely on CCUS, and uh, I think the audience will be glad to hear your views further. So we will now move on to our final speaker from Malaysia. Now, Malaysia has 15% of electricity consumption in Southeast Asia, and it is the fourth largest consumer. 28% of Malaysia's GDP is contributed by the energy sector. Hence, the transition from a fossil fuel dependent economy to a high value green economy must be done with foresight and creativity to maximize emission reduction potential, economic opportunities, cost effectiveness, and social inclusiveness. Let us now hear from Yang Berhormat Tuan Li Chiencheong, Member of Parliament of Petaling Jaya in Malaysia. Chiencheong, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone, uh, fellow participants, uh, speakers, and uh, Yuan Yong. Um, Prof. Yuan Yong, um, just to check if you can see my screen um, neatly. Is that all right? Yes, we can see. We can see. Okay, good. Um, I think uh, the formal um, forum um, panel speakers have uh, dealt with a very extensive uh, decarbonization effort uh, in respective countries. But on Malaysia, since uh, I only focus on the road transport uh, sector, so uh, I'll just confine my discussion on this sector. Um, but just a snapshot on uh, Malaysia uh, current uh, GHG emission. Uh, as we can see, uh, the energy uh, still constitute uh, the largest um, segment in terms of uh, uh, emission, followed by transport. Uh, industry, waste, agriculture, and etc. Uh, in Malaysia, it's also fortunate that um, the Lulu CF uh, did help in removing um, a lot of emissions in the past. But after 2004, uh, Malaysia has also faced mounting and increasing uh, levels of G net GHG emissions uh, in our country. So back to uh, transport. And I would like to begin with cars. Um, the government policy uh, on the uh, existing trajectory is that 50%, 15 percent of the total industry volume uh, for electrified vehicles will be achieved by 2030. Uh, another uh, 10,000 uh, vehicle or EV charging points to be ready by 2025. And uh, on top of that, uh, 1.5 million EVs uh, should be on the road by 2040. So this is what uh, the current uh, policies uh, aim to achieve. Uh, of course, on top of that, uh, we have also laid out uh, a list of uh, more ambitious uh, policies. Uh, it's a wish list, but at the same time, uh, hopefully uh, it is also uh, uh, something that is achievable if we look at uh, the modeling uh, which I will share later. So we hope to achieve annual sales of uh, 400,000 EVs uh, annually by 2030. Uh, secondly, uh, by 2030, uh, we should expect 40% of total industry volume or TIV uh, and 100% by 2040. Uh, meaning after 2040, under the high ambitious policies, there will be no, no more ICE vehicles uh, that uh, will be uh, sold uh, in Malaysia. Uh, thirdly, uh, 20 million EVs and 17 million electric motorcycles will be ready by 2050. And uh, of course, uh, 
mean following government suggestion uh, or recommendation that 10,000 EV charging points uh, should be ready by 2035. And now we are living with, with less than two uh, and a half year. Uh, so uh, let's uh, aim higher and shoot higher. <laughs> so to have a more than 10,000 uh, EV charging points by 2035 and 1.2 million by 2050. Uh, Malaysia also uh, has a biofuel policy uh, with a B20 blending target that was planned in 2020. However, it was not met. Uh, so hopefully it, it can be uh, met by 2025. Uh, we are also aggressively promoting public transport where by 2035, uh, we should expect 50% uh, or more the shift to urban public transport. Uh, currently we are at uh, quite a low level as Malaysia is a big uh, car economy. Uh, so the car ownership was, is also among the highest in the region. Uh, so it is it is challenging to uh, move people to use public transport. Uh, however, uh, it's something that is necessary if we would like to decarbonize uh, our transportation sector. Well, at the same time, uh, rail transport, uh, interstate transport by East Coast uh, Rail Link, and uh, high-speed rail connecting Kuala Lumpur and Singapore and uh, is uh, as, uh, estimated or it is, uh, uh, I mean, uh, assumed to be ready by 2026 and 2030 respectively. Uh, rail transportation, if we look at the growth rate uh, uh, under existing uh, policy, uh, the KGA is on 4.6%. Uh, we are setting a more ambitious policy uh, where um, 2023, uh, uh, I mean, moving forward, uh, it should be uh, an average of 13.2%. And after 2030, uh, the growth will slow down to 6% on rail transportation. Uh, this is uh, also uh, to take into account uh, more rails are being built in Malaysia. Uh, we have uh, upcoming uh, MRT3 uh, connecting Kuala Lumpur and neighboring mega cities. Uh, we have also committed uh, LRT in uh, Penang, uh, the northern uh, bigger city in the northern area of Peninsular Malaysia. Uh, some are also uh, pursuing um, some planning on the Borneo side of Malaysia, Sabah and Sarawak, especially uh, at the uh, urban area to have uh, more uh, rail connectivity. While well, bus transportation, uh, the existing policy actually put a very low growth rate. Um, so I'm putting a more ambitious growth rate uh, since 2018, which is uh, about 4.09%. Uh, there are some key assumptions here. Uh, first uh, is the KGA of uh, total registered vehicles. Uh, between 2018 to 2021 is 3.6%. So the same growth rate applies uh, for our projection. Uh, active vehicles in Malaysia, active vehicles means uh, the vehicles that are uh, actively on the road and uh, being driven uh, by um, and road, road tax or the road permits being renewed. Uh, so they are 65.2% on 2021. Uh, the same percentage uh, show apply. Average vehicle split between uh, car, motorcycle, bus, freight and others also expected to stay the same. Uh, average, so a uh, so to average vehicle kilometer, kilometer traveled for car, for motorbike, uh, for commercial freight vehicle, for bus, uh, all these are local data compiled and uh, tested by our road transport department. So all these figures uh, are used to suit uh, local condition. I did compare some of these figures with international figures. It seems that um, the average vehicle kilometer travel for car in Malaysia is slightly higher than the world average. Presumably, uh, Malaysia is heavy on car, where we really drive a lot compared to other countries. Uh, whereas for commercial freight vehicle, uh, we are also on the high side. Um, I mean, it can be explained by uh, we are having good road system where uh, trucks and lorries are really uh, managed to travel uh, to almost every corner uh, of the country. Um, and last but not least, tax higher and drive cars 
other smaller types of vehicles are categorized as cars. So um, this is uh, the modeling where under existing policy pathway, uh, we can see that um, the usage of gasoline uh, will not just stop there and it will continue to grow. Um, likewise uh, to this. Uh, and hence uh, the emission of uh, CO2 and other GHG gas gases are also, uh, I mean, projected to be um, high uh, coincide with uh, the growth of uh, usage of gasoline and diesel. Under a more ambitious pathway, it seems uh, if uh, the government is uh, determined to um, have a more green roadmap, uh, the usage or consumption of gasoline uh, will be compressed uh, uh, when we move towards uh, 2040. Uh, but of course, it, is a it will be accompanied by a higher use of electricity when we see more um, uh, EVs are on the road. Uh, this so, um, we, are, we shall explain later the growth of growth rate of diesel usage continue to climb because EV only managed to clip uh, the usage and growth of uh, petrol usage, but on diesel, which is used prim primarily by uh, heavy vehicles, uh, there is no end uh, in, in using diesel um, to drive. Um, this is um, a more ambitious policy, as you can see, the CO2 uh, is also contained and uh, dropped, uh, in fact. Uh, so I'm doing a comparison uh, uh, more ambitious, uh, on the more ambitious pathway, we can see there'll be a net negative usage of gasoline uh, as well as some diesel uh, and a net growth of electricity, uh, usage of electricity. So same goes to um, the net emission of uh, greenhouse gas. We are seeing a good progress in uh, reducing uh, CO2 emissions if we have a good good map to decarbonize our transportation sector. A few points for discussion. Uh, decarbonizing commercial vehicles is critical as I have pointed out just now. Uh, it is critical because uh, heavy trucks and heavy freight vehicles continue to use diesel. So unless we have a hydrogen solution or we have an electric solution for them, uh, they will continue to grow. So we need to uh, have a specific policy to decarbonize commercial vehicles, think, taking into consideration of possible technological solution uh, or policy solution. Um, my current trajectory, we'll see 22 million active vehicles on the road by 2050, <laughs> because um, I project that the cars will continue to grow. It's really hard to take cars off the road unless we have good public transportation or uh, in long-term better urban planning to re reduce traveling. Um, so I propose an of life policy for passenger cars is necessary. Uh, for your information in Malaysia, there is no end of life policy for cars. So you can drive the cars as long as the cars are still fit on the road. Um, and we need that to accelerate EV transition. Third point, public transportation transition by encouraging bus is critical. I am still projecting a very conservative growth on bus. Uh, as we can see, uh, we need to put more buses on the road. Uh, it seems like quite in line with current government policy. So maybe on the high, the highly ambitious uh, uh, scenario, we can we can project a better growth on of bus. Uh, and last but not least, uh, can we have higher growth rate on rail transport? Uh, as I mentioned, MRT three, LRT Penang, and other projects are in the pipeline. Uh, traffic congestions are getting uh, also quite unbearable. So that will also induce people to use more rail uh, for long term travel. I mean, uh, interstate traveling as well as uh, urban traveling. Uh, so that's all from me uh, uh, on transportation uh, sector in Malaysia. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Tian Chung, for giving us a focused analysis of the transport sector in Malaysia. And transport is, um, is always either the highest or the second energy consumer in many uh, Southeast Asian countries. All right. We have actually gone past uh, our allocated time, but we see three hands have been up um, for a while. So let us now invite them. Uh, first, we'll start with Ong Yi Jian. Yi Jian, you can you are you can talk now. Would you like to articulate your question? And um, we also see uh, M. Uh, Boadi's hand hand is up as well. Boadi, would you like to speak? Boadi from Africa. Okay. Um, whilst waiting for you to get ready, um, let's see. There are some questions here in the Q and A chat box. I want to speak. Okay. I want to speak. Yeah, yes. I want to speak. Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm from Africa. I have a lot of projects that are seeking for um, finance. Do you have any other uh, uh, funding source uh, that's uh, from the, any of the this thing? Because most of the projects that I have in Africa, sometimes I even receive projects from Malaysia, India, Indonesia, Mal uh, Filipino. I have major projects in billions in, in energy in uh, infrastructure in other sector, biomass like this, even some in uh, Vietnam government that they are looking for funding, JVC or SPV or uh, boots. So sometimes uh, when you want to the investors or the uh, donors or the lenders, sometimes the facilitators want to take up upfront in which the project owners are not ready to pay. It is 3 a.m. So I'm looking for, if you have anything, you can recommend me to any of those um, linked up so that I can from, submit the project's work so that we can, uh, the project can be funded. Some of the projects are from governments, some projects are from the private sectors. Some of the projects are from Africa, some of the projects are from Asia, Malaysia, in Filipino. So I'm looking for links. I, may, I have a project, I have a company, J Development Group. That's my company. So... If you can link that, or you can ha you have any investor or any bank that will not take any upfront, I'm ready to submit those projects in billions. Some of the projects in billions, some of the in millions, some of the and thousands of dollars. So I need a link up. Yeah, it become okay. very competitive cool. markets. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye. Thank you for your question. Um, Thank you. The nature of projects are very varied, and hence the type of financing that's suitable for the project varies as well yeah. and the source of fundings are varied so it is hard to answer this question uh, in a general way uh, I'll, I'll leave my email address in the chat box uh, i think uh, this good. question uh, needs yeah. some, um, it needs to look at more specifically thank you uh, thank you uh, yi jian okay um there are some questions in the q and a box um if our speakers would like to respond to any of them, uh, please um, please do so. Okay, there is a there there, there is a question here. Uh, the slow progress on decarbonization is often attributed to the lack of political will, which leads to low public awareness. And the reverse can also be said to be true. For example, in 2021, only 57% of the 12,000 respondents to a global survey believe that a political candidate's record and position on climate action act affected their voting decisions. So this highlights the need for greater civic engagement so that politicians are increasingly held accountable for their legislative contribution and public investment in climate action. So how might Southeast Asian countries increase political will and civic engagement in climate action? Any takers? 
uh, Chen Chung. Might you like to mm, yeah. comment okay, on think, this? Um, uh, a, a quick answer is that apart from uh, personal passion and um, advocacy work, uh, it is important to um, uh, make sure uh, we have a better accountability uh, on uh, climate change agenda. Uh, so I would uh, suggest to um, civil society and the climate change watch groups uh, to also monitor uh, the, the, the speeches or the policy suggested by politicians so that uh, it can be made known uh, by the public on uh, how much effort that uh, each politician uh, has done in uh, decarbonizing their economy and, and also to introduce uh, more sustainable uh, goals uh, to our future uh, development. Uh, and uh, besides that, uh, uh, regionally, I think it's also important for ASEAN uh, to put or to push uh, the green agenda as uh, one of the main priority. Uh, apart from uh, seeing, uh, I mean, uh, the annual meeting, it would be good to have more uh, side meetings uh, discussing and deliberating on uh, some concrete issues. I'm not saying um, setting our uh, different goals than what we have uh, pledged uh, in uh, our COP meeting, but uh, we can discuss more local issues and that benchmark on it. For instance, uh, uh, ASEAN Power Grid. ASEAN Power Grid is so important in ensuring um, stability uh, and affordability of uh, green electricity. Uh, however, we see little progress in the past. Uh, so my suggestion is that can we make this uh, one of the top agenda and can we uh, really pursue it with concrete goals so that in the next three years, five years, uh, we would see uh, some uh, very uh, good results uh, from, from the discussions and meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Chung. Uh, Vibo, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, Asian have done a lot of things. We have worked together to find out a way to promote the green energies and among each uh, Asian member. But still, um, every country have their own um, barriers and problem as well. For example, like uh, in Cambodia, I mean, the uh, public awareness is should be improved because of the um you know um the knowledge and the um the people i mean i can say that the people understand climate change impact but most of them do not know how to uh reuse or mitigate the uh, emission from their i mean from their from individually i mean um the government have the policies have the regulation but the people really like, for example, like uh, we have a uh, energy efficiency uh, policy, but um, we uh, uh, each household or community do not really have how to do, do not really have any idea how to do to um, reuse the uh, their energy consumption, and they just um, maybe it's because of their knowledge and uh, because of the the lifestyle of them. I mean. Some, especially uh, from my experience, the rich people in 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 the city, they they don't care uh, the the energy consumption because they say that they have a lot of money, so they can spend on the energy consumption every month. So um, they say that oh, I have I, I use a lot of energy, and they are proud of that. You know, that is the behavior. I mean, the government should uh, increase or should have the uh, the the, the enhance the public awareness of. Uh, the importance of uh, using the uh, energy consumption, household energy consumption or industrial sector as well. And the um, incentive is a big important as well in Cambodia because um, the people really want, I mean, some uh, industrial sectors or household, they want to install, like, for example, like energy, uh, solar energy on the rooftop. But uh, I mean, from my experience, because I have talked to, uh, I have one study about the uh, energy rooftop, and then I, I talked to the private sector, and they say that it's quite difficult to work with the government to, I mean, to to request or to register, uh, to submit the form to 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 request for installing the 
uh, solar rooftop um, because they need a lot of time, a lot of resource as well, and you don't know how to work with it, uh, you cannot have it. I mean, you cannot receive the permission from the government. So usually they, uh, the private sector encourage people not to, to I mean, not to connect to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the grid, we just to use a standalone uh, solar power. So, I mean, there's a lot of things to do and even the regulation as well is not clear to the people and even they have a regulation, but they don't have a re really a specific plan for each uh, inline ministries or, or industry to follow, to, to implement it. It's just to show the donor that they have the um uh they have the the plans and just want to attract the uh, investor to invest in the um energy so it needs a lot of work to do and i think um uh what we can do is uh, each uh country member uh, asian uh, country member have should have clear policies and implementation is very important as well so just have the policies and implement it and improve their commitment and also public awareness is important as well. This is what I can say. Thank you very much, Vibold. Okay, we will now sum up. High cost is a barrier uh, to the transition to a low carbon economy, as we have heard today, because many countries do not have enough resources and developing economies find the challenge particularly steep. Of course, there are also technological challenges, challenges in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. More efficient ways to store renewable energy still need to be developed to enable its higher penetration in the grid. Fostering greater political will to decarbonize involves raising awareness of the climate crisis, like what we are doing today. And thank you very much for your participation. Um, it also requires us demonstrating the benefits of meaningful decarbonization, building a coalition of support, electing leaders who are supportive of meaningful decarbonization, and ultimately holding leaders accountable. The development decarbonization de contradictions that we heard today highlights um, the climate prob problem cannot be solved exclusively with materialistic solutions because these materialistic solutions do not address the addictive lock of increasing consumption. Human progress needs to shift from outward, which is about consumption and territorial expansion, to inward, which is about pro properly establishing the relationship between humans and the universe. What you have heard today is the outcome of ASEAN Green Future Project Phase 2.1. We are starting Phase 2.2 this month, where the country models will aim for 100% renewables or to the extent possible as allowed by renewable resources available in each country. This scenario will then be used to explore integration across countries to optimize interconnection, imports and exports of renewable or clean energy in AGF phase 2.3. Phase one of the ASEAN Green Future Project presented the emission profiles for Southeast Asian countries and the key technology and policy opportunities and challenge challenges ahead in our decarbonization journey. So this work can be accessed through the web link that is that we will now post in the chat room. Okay, on this note, I will thank all the speakers and their team for their hard work in um, phase 2.1 of ASEAN Green Future. And we thank um, the audience for coming together today to listen, to expand understanding, to ask questions, and to discuss. And um, we will keep you posted on uh, the next phase of the ASEAN Green Future Project. And see you again soon. Thank you very much, everyone.